The Game Boy Color came out 25 years ago, and after all that time, it's finally possible to bring it into the modern era with a new AMOLED screen mod. Hey guys, Taki here. If you're a fan of the Game Boy Color like I am, I have an awesome mod video for you with a new mod kit that just released for the Game Boy Color. This is going to be a deep dive review into this kit to see what it is, what it does, and if it's worth the asking price. Let's jump into it. The star of the show is this AMOLED display that comes from a BlackBerry Q10 and this adapter PCB for the GBC. On top of this, we have a pre-cut shell that will make this build super easy. You can modify an official shell by yourself if you want to save on some money, but that's probably only worth doing if you have a shell that you really have your sights set on reusing. This one feels like OEM quality, and it's a great option to go with if you have a beat up GBC. I went with this green shell option because I don't already have a GBC with this colorway in any of the builds that I have. When it comes to pricing, it's gonna come down to the package that you buy. If you just want the screen itself, that's gonna set you back $50. If you want the full kit with a custom shell, that'll cost an additional $5, and I think it's worth every dollar for the time that it saves you. Game Boy Colors are surprisingly pretty rare where I live, and I think it's because this was never officially sold in this country. All of the models that exist on the secondhand market where I live are ones that were imported from Japan, Europe, or the United States, and that's the case with this one that I bought for this video. This is a Japanese GBC, and I paid $60 to get it. I would expect that you'd be able to get one much cheaper than this where you live, but this is the average going rate for GBCs where I live that don't have any issues. The shell in this one is pretty decent, all things considered. It is aged, but it hasn't yellowed as much as some of the other ones that I've seen. This condition is much better than the last GBC that I bought for a modding project, and that one was only $10 cheaper than this. Because this shell's in such good condition, I think I'm gonna keep it to reuse it in another build. Everything else here is in full working order, including the speakers and all of the ports. We need to start this process with a quick disassembly of the stock shell. This process is very easy to do with only a few screws to deal with, but if you need some help, don't forget to enlist a little engineer. Then it's just a matter of disconnecting the stock screen to free the PCB. Now at this point, we would clean and reuse the stock membranes. If you have good ones, this is going to be your best bet to keep the authentic feel of the buttons. I think I will end up getting another GBC in about a week or so that is in worse condition than this, so I'm gonna keep all of these buttons for a future build. For this build, I'm going to use everything that came with this $55 package. Now we're at the point where we need to solder this red wire to the battery point on the adapter PCB. They have already pre-tinned this pad, so it should be extremely easy to do. And after we have that lead connected, we can now move forward to reattaching the FPC to this board, and then we can plug in the new screen. You'll see that this one comes with adhesive strips on the sides of the screen. I took off the bottom half of this just to make it easier to get back in here if I ever need to. This kit also comes with some film that they say to apply to the back metal surface of the screen to protect it from shorts, but as you can see, the back of the screen isn't exposed in the kit that I have. I don't think we need to apply this, but we may need to apply some tape in here so there aren't any shorts caused by other points. I'm not gonna do that right now. We're gonna take that adapter board and feed the screen cable through the slot to connect the screen to the board. Then we need to slide this screen into place from the front and move on to the next step. So something that I'm noticing about the buttons that come with this kit that you should probably be aware of is that the measurements don't seem to line up exactly with the official ones. You can see that the center post on the D-pad is a bit longer on the original one that I have here, which means that this is going to potentially bottom out when you press it down. This could have the potential to give you some false inputs. So if you have the ability to reuse the set of buttons that came with your Game Boy Color, just do that. The A and B buttons also have this issue, but the D-pad is the most important one from the bunch. If you need to, you can also DIY this center post to make it long enough that this isn't an issue. But realistically, you want something like this that is like the original. I won't use my original buttons because I want to stick with the things that came with this kit so I can review it. With whatever combination you plan to use, put them in place and then you can install the stock PCB. If I flip this over, you can see what I'm talking about with the D-pad. It just isn't tall enough right now. The D-pad can bottom out. And the same thing goes for the A and B buttons. I'm going to screw in one of the internal screws just to keep everything in place for the next step. To be able to power the screen, we need to solder the other end of that red wire to the point labeled C on the power switch. This is the only annoying part of this build, but it should be a breeze if you have experience soldering other things. Make sure you have some solder on your wire, and you should be good to go without too much trouble. So I'm going to hold the wire in place to solder it to the C pad. Then we can reconnect the display cable before making sure that the entire thing works. Put the back shell on and get some batteries to see if the display will light up and we can see that it does work. Now all we need to do is screw in the remaining PCB screws, put on the back shell, screw in the six back shell screws, put in some batteries, and close it up. Anyway, we're finished with the build, and I have to say I'm pretty impressed with this. I did some testing off camera just to experience the quality of this display and the pure blacks in some of these retro games. It is amazing. 
What I want to do now is go through some of the features of this, and then we'll do a comparison between this and the next best modding option that currently exists. So right now we're booted into a game and it's just going to loop around in the background while we talk about the screen. This kit comes with a touch screen, and we can access it by putting our finger right here. When this opens, we have a couple of things available to us, and we can do everything with touch. For example, our first option is brightness, and we can adjust the brightness by pressing on the triangles. Doing something like this isn't new because other mod kits have other ways of adjusting brightness via a start and select or a touch sensor on the top. This is way easier to do than any of those options. Beyond that, we also have this color mode option. If you go down to the second color mode, you'll be looking at the game how it would be on a modded DMG or a Game Boy Pocket, and we can compare this to a modded Pocket in a moment. Let's open up that menu again, and we'll just cycle through some of these color palettes. Realistically, these are not terribly useful on a Game Boy Color, since the default one will be superior in almost every instance. I feel like these things would be more useful on older Game Boy models. Very quickly, you might see some strobing on the screen in this footage. You can't see that with the naked eye. This is typical behavior when filming AMOLED displays, and it is only visible to the camera. So let's open up that menu again, and now we'll go through the pixel effects. The second option has vertical scan lines, which looks decent, and the third option has horizontal scan lines. The last option will do both, and it'll create square pixels. It is cool that you have the ability to quickly swap between these, but they will decrease your maximum brightness when you enable them. I think the first and the second option are the best. So that's the whole first menu. If we want to get to the next menu, we're going to need to swipe up from this, and we have something called FRM. I'm going to boot into another game so we can showcase what that does. In Link's Awakening, you'll see that this chain is flickering on screen. That is what we want to fix. If we go back into that menu again and turn on FRM, the transparency flickering will be fixed. There are other games that use rapid flickering on official hardware to achieve transparency, and this is the option that you need to use to make them look how they would on real hardware. Beyond that, we can also customize the screen position. This is mainly meant to fix any alignment issues with the panel. Mine was almost completely centered with the default settings and it only required one change. In the last menu, you'll find the logo color options. If I tilt the screen back, you can see the cutout for the Game Boy Color logo. This option will allow us to turn on that part of the AMOLED screen with different colors. There are a lot of colors available here, which totally brings the entire package together by allowing you to customize the color of this logo with whatever shell you want to use. It also looks better than other options because this is fed by an awesome AMOLED display. I'm going to go with this green one, and then I should be good to go. I think this combo looks very good. I gotta say, I'm blown away by how good this display looks. The default screen resolution is 720 by 720 but obviously, we don't have access to that full resolution. With the resolution that we do have access to, this is going to do integer scaling. So every pixel that you see on screen is made up of many smaller pixels that will give you a very sharp image. For this test, we have Metroid 2, and I turned on the black and white mode on the GBC for this. The Pocket doesn't have an exact match for this, but it's close enough for us to see some of the differences for these older games. I'm going to have to shut off my studio lights so we can really see the differences here, but even without doing that, you can already see the deep blacks on this AMOLED display versus on the Pocket. I had to crank up the ISO a bit to make this easier to see in the footage. I have to say I have no issues with the way that the Pocket looks, and I'm very happy with this display, but there is no comparison for a game like this when you have an AMOLED display that gives you perfect blacks. The viewing angles are also much better on the AMOLED mod versus this older IPS one. In this test, we have the Q10 AMOLED display versus the Q5 IPS kit for the GBC, which was the best screen mod available for the GBC before this new mod kit. As you can see, they look similar in this setting, but this game has pure black background, so we should see some differences if we were to shut off the studio lights again. On the Q5 panel, the background starts to distort when viewed at an angle, but the new AMOLED display keeps the deep blacks in the background. And as a quick side, if you end up playing a game like this at night on your GBC that's modded with this display, it's going to look ridiculous how perfectly isolated everything is when the background is completely shut off. 10 out of 10 experience. During the last test, I noticed that I was seeing more power draw from the Q5 screen compared to this newer one. Because of that, I want to do a battery life test to see where things are. I bought a set of IKEA 2450 cells for this test. These are the best cells that I can buy where I live that I know are not going to be fraudulent, and they should be comparable to Eneloop cells. For this, I set my camera on a time lapse, but this footage went longer than I expected. When it comes to the Q5 display with a stock GBC cartridge, we got 5 hours and 48 minutes of battery life. Not bad, but not as good as this AMOLED display with almost two additional hours of battery life compared to the older best-in-slot screen. After that test, I'm surprised how this new mod holds up. 
even though the screen cut out earlier on the Q5 GBC, the batteries that were in it were still good enough to be used in the AMOLED GBC after 8 hours with the console left on or three hours after the screen cut out. That tells me that the cells drop below the required current or voltage that this Q5 screen needs in order to power on, whereas the AMOLED screen must have lower requirements. This test would be even worse if we did this test using two flash carts. This mod kit is now the GOAT for GBC modding. It's the only one that I'll probably consider going forward for future builds. Now that I know I'm gonna keep this, I'm gonna go back inside and add some insulation material to the back of the PCB, and I'm going to put some tape on the little adapter board so it doesn't move around in here because I did have a problem where I would put this sideways or upside down at night and the screen would cut out and the system would short. So I'm gonna go ahead and solve this problem because I really like this and I need to be able to have this top down for playing at night lying down. There are two areas that we need to worry about. Back here is where they expect you to insulate based on a conversation that I had with the company, so I will apply some material here. I think the short was happening in another location, so I will also insulate the adapter board and secure it in place so it can't move around at all. I plan to use this long term, so I don't want to ever have to come in here again in the future to fix any issues down the line. There are a few more tests that I want to do before wrapping up this video. The first thing that I want to do is check on the response time of this panel. If I had data sheets for both panels, it would be as easy as just comparing the specs, but I don't think the spec sheet is public for the AMOLED display. I'm going to use some gameplay to get a rough idea of how they stack up. In this, we're basically going to be looking for how much ghosting we have on the screen. The Q5 screen is rated for 16 milliseconds response time, which is one frame, and this new AMOLED display seems to be the same based on what I'm seeing here. The next thing that is easy for us to talk about is color. Now this AMOLED display seems to have much deeper colors than this Q5 panel, and this is probably because it has a wider color gamut than the sRGB of the Q5 panel. If you look at the blue in the background and the green in the pipes, those pop more on the AMOLED display. The Q5 display does get one stop brighter at around 400 nits of peak brightness, but even if we match both screens based on max brightness, there is still a difference in the saturation of colors. Mind you, there's nothing wrong with this Q5 panel, and it is already a monumental improvement over the stock screen that you saw at the beginning of this video, but it doesn't look as good as this AMOLED display when they're side by side like this. Everything just has a deeper tone. These reds in the names are deeper, the greens are deeper, and the blues are especially deeper everything just pops more on this display. If we get to the main title menu, you can see a lot of differences between these, and I included a screen grab of how this should look in the top right hand corner of the screen. The purples on the Q5 screen are more muted versus the Q10 screen, with the Q10 being closer to the reference picture. Again, you will see a noticeable difference between Mario, the pipes, and the bricks between both units. This difference carries over to Shantae, where we also see a wider range of red colors in this roof, as well as the orange in the chat box. Here's a close-up. And we have one final close-up for this section. While we're here, let's go through some close-up shots of the pixel effects. This is the default mode. This is mode two. Mode three. And finally, mode four. Anyway, let's go over some pros and cons of this new screen before wrapping up with my overall suggestions. On the pro side, there are a lot of things that I like about this kit. The first is that it's an easy installation. In terms of difficulty, I would put this at two out of 10, and that extra point of difficulty only comes from the fact that you need to own a soldering iron to be able to do this. You don't have to be good at soldering to be able to do this because they already pre-tinned one pad. Everything else is pretty simple and you could be a complete novice and still get this thing installed correctly. As long as I soldered the wire, I feel confident that Taki Jr. could do the entire build without my help. The second pro for me is battery life. This thing, has amazing battery life versus the competition. It's not as good as the stock screen with good batteries, but it is compared to other backlight screens that are on the market. The picture quality on this is also amazing. That goes for the deep blacks and games that use black backgrounds like Metroid, but it also extends to the brightness, response time, color saturation, and gamut coverage. The shell is also a pro. For $5, it's well worth the cost for what you get, especially when you consider that this exact shell goes for $10 on its own. The touchscreen OSD menu is also an awesome feature. I read some comments from people that were expecting touch support to be a gimmick, but it is way more useful than you would expect, especially if you're used to older OSD kits. To be able to get the same functionality, you need to solder two additional wires on competing kits, and those wires are way more difficult to solder than the main one that we did in this video. I also like the logo customization, as well as having the ability to turn it off completely without any light bleed at night. That's a big feature. Finally, I think this is an affordable mod. For only a few dollars more than the Q5 screen mod by itself, you get an AMOLED panel, a new shell, replacement buttons, and new rubber membrane pads. 
it's a good deal, especially if you can get a used GBC for cheap where you live. When it comes to cons, there's really only one thing that I can say, and it's not related to the screen. It's related to the buttons that come with this kit. The D-pad and A and B buttons are not the same size as the original ones. That is going to mean that the D-pad will bottom out when you press on it, and it will occasionally give you the wrong input when you press it. That's why you should reuse the original D-pad if you can, or buy a replacement one from another company that has a known good component for sale. That's the only bad part of this kit. Everything else is exceptional. And that's going to wrap up things on this video for the new Game Boy Color AMOLED screen mod. It is an amazing mod that I think is well worth the asking price. Given that these are using old BlackBerry Q10 replacement screens, who knows how many of these are available on the market. So this is going to be something that you're going to want to own while it's still available because this is currently the definitive version of the Game Boy Color that is possible with any screen mod. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see another, take a look at my review of the FPGBC. That's another great handheld for Game Boy Color games that also uses the Q5 screen from this video. Happy gaming everyone, talk you out.